Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight on Cinema Showcase, it's my very great pleasure to welcome as my guest one of Hollywood's great stars, Miss Myrna Loy. Right now, she's starring at the Midnight Sun Dinner Theater with Jean-Pierre Ramon in Neil Simon's very funny play, Barefoot in the Park. I hope you will join me tonight as I talk with Myrna Loy on Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much for joining me on Cinema Showcase tonight, and right now, join me in welcoming Miss Myrna Loy. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I hope you are, so far, enjoying your stay in our kind of rainy city right now. Well, just today, but we've had some lovely weather. And yeah. Of course, it's the perfect time of year to be in Atlanta, mm -hmm. because all the blossoms are just beginning to come out. Yeah. It's going to be fantastic. That's a perfect time to be here, it really is. Yes. I want to tell you, first of all, so we can get all of the um, semi-flattery out of the way at the beginning, how much <laughs> I enjoyed seeing you in Barefoot in the Park. It is a very funny play, and it only reconfirms my belief that Neil Simon is, I think, the best comedy writer we have today. Oh, I don't think there's any question about it. I did it ten years ago, you know, and uh, recently when we were looking for something to do, I said, do you think it's too early to bring it back? And uh, apparently it, it wasn't because uh, audiences are having a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, um, it's my belief that the film uh, was not as good as the, as, as, the, as the play. Because the play depends a great deal on what goes on in the imagination of the audience. I mean, so many of the, 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 the misery that the people climbing those five <laughs> Six <laughs> flights of stairs with the stoop go through. That all has to be imagined, and, mm -hmm. and, and the Greek restaurant and all the horrors of the things they, I mean, the things that these two rather conservative people go through, myself and my son-in-law, mm -hmm. Steve Bradbury, who is a wonderful young actor, and I have uh, a lovely girl, Pat Carth, uh, Carpin is her name. Mm -hmm. She's a brilliant child. And uh, Richard Dubin plays the famous telephone man. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Jean-Pierre is, uh, is the ultimate in charm. I mean, yeah. he is, he has, uh, he's really wonderful, is the crazy Hungarian. What do you think makes Neil Simon play so fantastically popular with audiences? Now, I know some critics have, have said that maybe Simon isn't a great, great writer. I don't happen to agree with that. I think he is a great writer. Uh, but well, I don't do know think? what they want him to do. I think it probably is because they, uh, uh, th th there is an attitude about comedy that disturbs me very much, mm -hmm. always has, because I have played mostly comedy or comedy drama. And uh, for instance, with the Academy Awards, uh, which we saw, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, comedy is, is given a second place. In other words, in France, they have an award for comedy and they have an award for, for, uh, for drama. They have the two masks. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but I have always said, why do they do this? Because if there is a great comedy and, and there's a great drama, the great drama is going to win every time. Yeah. Uh, even, even, though, uh, even though they have some comedies, ha it happened one night, and several other great comedies have won, um, they very seldom do. And I think that that attitude carries over to the, to the writer of comedy. Because we had a time, they call it the golden years in, they call it, I, I call it the golden years in the theater when they had, had um, George Kaufman, yes. Moss Hart, all these people. Now they are respected because they're dead, I guess. <laughs> but but uh, Simon is, um, they keep wanting him to, to do, uh, you know, O'Neill or a something, serious I think, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that when he does a serious play, uh, he, he's done a few uh, on the verge of that. Um, he's, it's been absolutely wonderful. Prisoner of Second Avenue, a man, a man has a nervous breakdown. <laughs> he goes mad in, you know, with all the things he has to put up with. And well, it's very effective. Yeah. I think that, you know, because I think that there's such a closeness between com laughter and tears. Sure. Well, uh, Frank Capra, 
who has been here several times, made the point that comedy is such a part of our everyday lives, why shouldn't it be a part of our, our theater and an important yes, part of our yes. theater? Well, he's, he was, of course, a, a great one. I mean, I, I, did, I did Broadway Bill with him, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, unfortunately that was the only one I did do yeah. with him. But, well, but isn't yeah. it true, though, that, that comedy is really more difficult to do than, than drama? Well, I think so. I think it. Uh, I think it is. Um, I think it's more difficult. I, I don't. I've never been able to exactly explain that, uh, except that I think that it's the delicacy with which you touch it to yeah. make it work. And if you hit it too hard, it doesn't work. And that is true of this play. I know it so well, having done it before. And I know that if you do hit anything too hard, they they don't laugh. I mean, there's a way. There's a there's a way to do those jokes of his. That mm -hmm. They have to be real. They have to be uh, have really happening to people. You know? mm -hmm. If you don't play them that way, you don't. You don't. It doesn't work. I guess it boils down really to that one word of timing, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, it does. Because um, and it's a kind kind of um, rapport with the audience mm -hmm. too. But of course, the same thing is true with drama. I've played yeah. drama, and uh, I know that. Uh, uh, I've, I know that that, that's, that same thing happens. If you want to make them cry, you have to have that. Uh, but then, of course, I feel that everybody cries too much now, and they do really? everything too much. Yes, I do think so. I you think, think we're generally an speaking, I think that uh, because one of the great, I know that there are many, for instance, people trying to, um, b uh, Peter Bogdanovich, who is b you know, very talented, going mad trying to make those pictures. <laughs> He can't make <laughs> them, and and I I thought well he should come and talk to me I might be able to help him, because one of the things that we never did was that we never we always uh, for instance if if you want to make someone cry you turn away from it I mean you turn away from the tragedy mm -hmm. to make them cry I mean there's nothing for instance more there's nothing more moving than a man breaking down and mm -hmm. crying because it's hard to get him to cry. And the same thing is true of women. I mean, if, they're, if they fight emotion, then you, you, can, you, can, you can make it work. I think one of the best scenes that I ever had to play was in uh, Cheaper by the Dozen, and it was at the end, after the, the husband has died, and she had to talk to them, at the, she had to talk to them about what they were, what were going to have to do, how mm -hmm. what they were going to have to pick themselves up and go on, and the life was... And there was no fuss made about what had just happened. It was just be going. You were going on, and it was ter it was a very moving scene. Mm. And comedy is the same thing. I think that you uh, you uh, you have um, to make people laugh. You have to really do the same thing. You have to sort of give it to them and 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 then move away from it. But if you come down too hard, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Well, what do you do with an audience? Not with an audience, but what do you do if? If, let's say, in any given performance, the audience is just maybe not with you, they're not quite where you want them to be, do you try to compensate by playing it differently, or do you just go and do it? No, I just blame myself. Yeah. I say it's my fault. I, I, I've, I've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Either uh, they haven't heard what I said, or I have just, I'm off, and, and, um, or somebody else is off, and, and you, you, be, the, the, you, you, ha you really have to have to ask yourself, of course, there are s different types of audiences. Yeah. There are audiences that uh, are, especially in the dinner theater, this is my first experience in the dinner theater, I've never done it before, and in a dinner theater you are really much closer, they're right on that yeah. stage, and uh, <coughs> you, uh, you have to, um, that's why it has to be very, very natural. You mustn't. You can't ever overdo anything because if you do, you're, you know, they're 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 part of what's really w what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you have audiences that sometimes, if uh, not that Simon is in any way, um, uh, he 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 he's he's very he's very tasteful in the things he said. But there are some suggestive things. I mean, very very amusing things in in the play. And when they're but when they're done, there are some people that don't laugh at certain things because they they're they're just too close. I mean, you can see them yeah. laughing, and they're afraid <laughs> to laugh. Maybe you have those people, and uh, or you you will have some people that are just a little bit shy. Yeah. And then of course that sometimes happens in the beginning, and then gradually they begin to loosen up <laughs> and they begin to go because they can't resist it. That was an interesting point you made, though, about you think we maybe react too much to things today that we're maybe too emotional about things or we cry too much or whatever. 
but talking about actors. Well, I didn't mean that we cry too much. I, I meant that actors cry yeah. too much. I mean, right. I mean that there's, you know, that there are so many. The, the minute that there are too many tears, you, uh, automatically human beings say, ah, you know, I, and and they turn away from it. I mean, yeah. they they don't. They say, well, isn't that you know, it's too bad. I mean, I feel sorry, but 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 the th important thing is to fight it. Is mm -hmm. to really, you know. Yeah, Try was, not to. I was going to point out, though, that I think one of the most memorable scenes in Gone with the Wind that always people talk about is the scene in which Clark Gable cried. Yes. Because um, absolutely. I guess we knew that it was so difficult for him, yeah. for that character also. Yeah. And that's one of the scenes that stands out oh, so that's, beautifully. That's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. I wonder how many people remember that when Clark Gable was named king of the movies, you were named queen of the movies. <laughs> they don't remember me too well in that <laughs> capacity. How did that come about? Although he always called me Queenie. That was his <laughs> nickname for me. <laughs> but, um, well, it came about through um, the Daily News in New York, which has, has of course, probably they, and used to have, I don't know what it still has, but had the greatest entertainment um, Value. I mean, it, it 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 paid more attention to entertainment, particularly the movies. Mm -hmm. And so they had a contest with all their papers all over the country and in Canada and wherever they were, as to who th who was the king and the queen of the movies. And we won. <laughs> That's something, though, because everybody. That it was really a riot. Yeah, Ed Sullivan. Presumably. Ed Sullivan came out to the Hollywood, and he brought two crowns. They were made out of. Tin and they had they had purple velvet on them. So I still have mine. Oh. And he put these things on us. It was it, we had a, it would have been on television had there been any television, but there wasn't. So it was the uh, newsreel. Mm -hmm. We had a newsreel of us of us being crowned. Nice this riot. <laughs> <laughs> we were not. I don't think we were properly respectful. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it made for many jokes after that I because, bet. of course, many. Uh, Bill Powell sent me a huge box that looked like the most beautiful box of flowers you've ever seen, and I opened it up and it had a lot of old grapes in it, <laughs> <laughs> old sour grapes. <laughs> and uh, he signed it William the Third. He came in the third. I mean, it sort of started a dynasty in, at mm -hmm. MGM. And then uh, I see. I think that Spencer Tracy was the Iron Duke from then on, and you know all of these different people had these these titles. You know, to those of us who um, who really love movies, looking back on that period at MGM, it really seems almost incredible that so many people, great stars, great directors, composers, everybody, were under contract to that studio at one time. That, yes, that was. It was probably different for those people who were there, but looking back on it, it seems like a, a really incredible time. Yes, well, it was. It was because uh, you had at your service, you had so many writers. If you got into trouble, you could always get on the telephone and call Robert Benchley, and Robert, uh, you know, uh, George Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. and go on and on and on. Heck, McCarthy. If when they were there, they didn't. Ever, they never stayed very long. They used to write nasty notes and leave it on their <laughs> door and leave. But the uh, but you could call up and say, we're in trouble. Come and help us out. And they'd get us out. It was it was really remarkable. Well, it is now, too, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the talent now is uh, some of the, I think some of the acting talent is just so exciting. Today, you mean? Robert De Niro. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you saw that, you see them. You see him in Taxi Driver, and then you see him playing Irving Thalberg. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 wonderful. It's yeah. so exciting. You knew Thalberg, didn't you? Oh yes. Yeah. What? Yes. Uh, and his his performance is 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 creepy. It's really hmm. it's, it's really really incredible. Thalberg was considered, I suppose, the the first and original boy genius of Hollywood. What what made him stand out so much? Well, I don't know, and uh, the, I guess it probably was uh, a lot of other people had that kind of genius. They were, they, I mean, they were directors, and, and there were producers. But I think probably that he he uh, was able to achieve certain things. Uh, you know, he he was able to get Mayer and some of the powers that be off the beaten path a little mm -hmm. bit. You know, he he said, let's let's go this way, and they went, and it it was probably. Not to say that the, the pictures that they had made weren't great, because they, mm -hmm. they were. But he was—he had a certain, he had courage, and he was able to uh, to get them. He brought me there. I didn't know it. I never knew it until much, much later. But he brought me to MGM. I was—I had been, 
I had been at Warner Brothers and I had been at Fox and, and uh, several other places. And, and uh, he saw some of your pictures there? Or? He saw me in something that was, uh, that was uh, I, I don't know, it was a p picture I made called Skyscraper that mm -hmm. nobody ever heard of at Fox and he saw it. And, and, uh, and then he called me in one day and, and um, he gave me a, a talking to. He said, you've got to get over your shyness. He said, you are going to be very successful. And he said, you must just take hold of that, just say, you know, that you belong to me, this, you know, which of course I never could do, never would do, the audience. And he said, you've just got ma to make them listen to you. And he said, break, just break through that thing. And I apparently did later on, but not consciously, mm -hmm. you know. I was, I was a little, I guess I was a little withdrawn. Yeah. Well, of course, I was playing all those weird ladies, <laughs> you know, all those strange yeah, demons. You know, that's another misconception, I think, about your career. A lot of people think you just burst into overnight stardom with oh a Lord. thin man. No. But you had made some, what, 50 or 60 pictures before that? I had started in 1925 at Warner Brothers mm -hmm. playing, you know, uh, my first talkie was the Desert Song, mm -hmm. which of course was a marvelous part, but it was a, it was a desert rat. I played Azuri, yeah. and, and, and I had to speak with an accent. And for a long time, I didn't speak English. I didn't st speak pure English. I, w I spoke, I did nothing but those Orientals, gypsies, yeah. all, you know, all kinds of things that were not, uh, we're so far, really, when you come to it, from uh, the thin man. I wonder what it was that they saw in you that made them think you were the perfect Oriental. I was a dancer, and I had, uh, and I was one of the many people who discovered me. I mean, there were many. You know, there are always yeah. so many people that have something to do with your, with your life, as as with W. S. Van Dyke had at mm -hmm. MGM, but um, uh, the. Um, uh, Rudolph Valentino saw some photographs of me and took me over to meet his wife, and he was seriously considering putting me in in a film that he made called Cobra. Mm -hmm. But I was just I wasn't you know I wasn't ready for it. I was uh, he made they made a test of me, then she put me in her film in a very exotic outfit. Uh, I was supposed to be she had these types of beauty and uh, Adrian designed the costume for oh. me. And it was a very exotic woman, and I was a dancer, you see. And I danced in several films, and of course I always danced those, you know, exotic things, and mm -hmm. that, that's where it came from, really. Hmm. Was it Van Dyke's idea to team you and William Powell for the thing? Yes, it was. I, I had done, um, uh, I did a picture called Penthouse, mm -hmm. which I have not seen in years, with Warner Baxter, that, he, that was the first picture I made with him. It's. Um, it's uh, Adolph Green's one of his favorite comedies. Oh, and he yeah. always says that, well, because he's a great fan. You know, he's a great buff. If I can't remember something, I call up Adolph <laughs> and I say, who, who was that actor that did, <laughs> you know, so and so? And he knows. But uh, I did that. Then I did, um, uh, then I did Manhattan Melodrama, yeah. which was in which I started with Clark and wound up with William Powell at mm -hmm. the end of that. And uh, so then, when uh, Van Dyke got the script. It was a small budgeted picture, The Thin Man, you see. And uh, he called, uh, he called him up, he said, I want Powell and I want Loy. Wait, well, Loy, what do you want Loy for? He said, well, I, you know, I want her. I, I know that she can play this part. This is, you know, the, these are the two I want. He had done a detective. He had played Philo Vance or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but did you pattern Nora from, how did you go about finding out how to play that part? I just played myself, really. really? Oh, yes. It was very much of a... And, of course, that's usually the hardest thing to do. I mean, you know, you hide, and like, the actors hide and things, and I'd hidden in these, <laughs> these <laughs> vampires a long time. And, but by that time, I apparently had the courage just to come out and, and uh, you know, and, and play this, uh, this lady. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. it was a wonderful part. She, she originally, in the book, she was uh, she was not exactly in the book the way she was in the in the sc in the screenplay. Mm -hmm. But do you know who she was? No. Lillian Hellman. Really? <laughs> yes, she was. D Dashiell Hammett wrote it, and he he once told me he once told me when I uh, when he came out for a brief visit to us, he said, uh, "Do you know who that?" He said, "I I patted that woman after after." My girlfriend, Lillian Hellman. My yeah. yes, isn't that funny? <laughs> and yet it isn't funny when you think about uh, Lillian and her, uh, you know, her liberalism yeah. and all. She probably, as a young woman, she, uh, she probably was uh, very gay. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Did you have any idea when you were making The Thin Man that it was 
going to be as popular as it was and spawn an entire series? Oh, yes, and, and the brightest, I mean, we were into it two or three days, and, and, and there was just no really? question. Oh, yes. <laughs> Couldn't, it was so witty, and it was so, of course, it was the, uh, it was written, you know, by uh, Albert Hackett and Francis Goodrich, mm -hmm. and they did, they did, uh, um, they did several of them until Albert told me that he just couldn't take it any longer. <laughs> he said, I can't do another one. <laughs> but that happens to everything. Yeah. He did, I don't know how they did three, I think, of them. And there were, what, and six? And we always got, there were six all six together. Altogether. Bill and I did other, other pictures, of oh, yeah. course. You yeah. know, we did many. We did 13 all together. Goodness. I was trying, the last one, the last Thin Man, well, I guess was Song of the Thin Man, wasn't it? In which yes. you had yes. a son, I think. No, I had a son before that. Oh, I had a son yeah. before that, and then then we sent him to <laughs> we sent him to school <laughs> <laughs> because Bill said I I thought it was wonderful to have this son, and we had a I had a lovely scene where I hid him in the bottom drawer of, you know, of this house in Long Island because the you know I was the, 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 we were threatened with kid, somebody kidnapping him, <laughs> and I was so excited about having this child and everything. He said, "Listen." He said, the next picture, he said, we'll be sending him to, <laughs> he said, he'll be in high school. He said, then he'll be in college. And what does that make me? Because <laughs> we could see that this was coming, that this yeah. was going to be a series. And he was right. So for some reason or other, we talked about him, but he was always off. He was always, always away. He was away, and then everybody <laughs> forgot about him. <laughs> now, I've heard stories that that marvelous little dog, Asta, yes. you couldn't really play with off camera. Oh, no, Why no. was that? Well, because he was a professional dog. Well, he was he was trained, right. uh, um, you know, bless him, but he was trained to do things for certain, you know, he, mm. he had to do exactly, and if, you, and if you, you, you couldn't break up the routine. <laughs> he actually was remarkable. He had a, if you, I used to carry a little squeaky mouse, or Bill would carry it. This thing, he loved this thing. You put it in your pocket, and then he would go through his paces and then you would let him have the squeaky mouse and you'd give him a biscuit. And uh. he would, he was amazing. No, but he, you couldn't, you, you couldn't se separate, you see, you couldn't interfere with that relationship that he had with his trainer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was because it would, uh, it would be, it would divert him, I guess. Yeah, you know? yeah. One of your pictures in, I, I think, the mid-30s that I do want to talk about is The Great Ziegfeld, mm -hmm. which I think won the Academy Award as Best Picture of the Year. Of its year, I think it did. Yeah, and yeah. you played Billy Burke. Yes, in that picture, did she uh, advise you at all? She was all adorable. On she was absolutely. I felt a little self-conscious about it because yeah. everybody else is dead in the picture, and and and, and Billy was <coughs> was the only one living. Mm -hmm. And I felt a little self-conscious about playing, and I didn't. I didn't caricature. Uh, yeah. I didn't. I didn't make a caricature of her. I just played my. I just played myself and put a blonde yeah. wig on. You know. And, but she used to come and bring people to watch us on, on set. I mean, she'd bring her friends, and she asked me for a photograph, <laughs> a signed photograph. She was a lovely person, just yes. adorable. And so I felt much better about it. Yeah. But uh, uh, I didn't attempt to, uh, to be her, I mean, with all those funny little things that she did. Mm -hmm. know, that would have, it wouldn't have worked, I don't yeah. think. Before we run out of time, we only have three or four minutes left, mm -hmm. I do want to talk about one of your pictures that um, Goodness knows is one of the greatest pictures ever made, and that's the best years of our lives. Yeah, uh, and you did this right after World War II. How did you become involved in this? Was it it was a project you wanted to do, wasn't it? Oh yes, yeah. yes. Well, Sam Goldwyn was an old friend of mine, and uh, uh, he uh, was a little afraid to ask me to do it because he didn't think it was you know it, it was a that, that was a picture with so many mm -hmm. stars in it you know. So I, of course, I read it and said, yes, of course, absolutely. And uh, Robert Sherwood, you know, I mean, what, can, what you know, and, and of course, uh, uh, it was McKinley Cantor originally mm -hmm. who wrote the, uh, wrote the book, you see. He wrote the, uh, <coughs> wrote, it was called, um, dear, what was it, I can't think of the name of it now. Uh, it was not called best <coughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> The Best Years of Our Lives. I can't think of it either. So it was, um, but it was a, um, Lovely book, and mm -hmm. I had read. I uh, I read. I got the book and read that too. Glory for me. Yeah, it was gone. Mm -hmm. And um, which was a very good title. And why they called it Best Year of the Wise, I'm, I'll never know. But uh, and maybe they thought that would look better on the marquee. I have no idea. <laughs> no, I just never thought about it. Yeah. 
but it's a good movie. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen it recently? I saw it only. I saw. I saw part. I saw pieces of it. Mm -hmm. I understand it was here fairly. Yeah. It showed me. But I saw it last year when uh, at the Weiler, uh, uh, when they had the you know the award, mm -hmm. uh, the film festival. Well, I'm uh, glad. Not film festival, but the film the award. AFI. For, yeah. Yes, AFI. Well, I'm so glad to know you watch your uh, your movies. There are so many, so many stars who say, "No, I don't watch my old movies. Why would I want to do that?" But I'm well, glad to know you don't have anything against seeing your films. Oh, I made a lot of good ones. You sure did. <laughs> yeah. And you the interesting thing is that they're being appreciated. When I see the, the age of some of these youngsters that mm -hmm. recognize me now, I just, I think, I say, well, thank God for television. You know, yeah. So. Well, that's the great thing about some of those films, all of the, th most of the Thin Man films and films like Test Pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't seem to date, whereas other films of the period may. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've tried to figure out what it is about them, and uh, the only thing I can come up with, either it's the, uh, the writing, mm -hmm. or it's the <coughs> way Myrna Loy plays it, or Clark Gable plays it, or whatever, but they just don't seem to date. Yeah. Uh, the only things that do date are the ones that are fairly kind of stylized mm -hmm. things. I mean, you see certain type of, uh, but uh, it is extraordinary, yeah. really. We are just about out of time, and I want to take just a second to let you know how much I've enjoyed you being here. It's been a pleasure for me. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it, too. Great. And I want to urge everybody to go see you and Jean-Pierre Ramon at the Midnight Sun Dinner. And today. you must talk to Jean-Pierre about his book. I will. I just finished it. It's wonderful. Great. And thank you for coming. And if you're in Atlanta again, please stop back. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to all of you for watching. Until next time, good night.